Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church of Lansing. Whether you're here this morning in person or you're joining us online, we're so glad that you're spending our Sunday, your Sunday morning with us. My name is Nicole and I am the music director. And um, I have a few little housekeeping things we go through before we actually begin service. Um, first, if you have any prayer requests, there are yellow cards that are in the back of the pews. You can write your prayer requests on those. And there's a little offering plate by the kind of those main doors that you come in in the center. You can leave those prayer requests in that offering plate. And then we make sure that those are addressed during our prayer time. You can also leave your offering, if you so wish, in that offering plate at any time as well. If you're joining us online, we want to be able to pray for you as well. So please write your prayer requests in the comments of this feed. And then we um, write those down for you and make sure that we can pray for you as well. And if you um, would like to take communion with us, we have an open table. Anyone is welcome to join us. Um, we do it both by intinction, so you can come up and at the proper time and dip the bread in the cup. Um, or if you wish to be served an individual communion, you can remain in your seated. A deacon will serve that for you. If you need a gluten-free option, we also have those out on the narthex by the bulletins that are out there. So I think that is all I have to say. So please stand if you are able and let's sing our opening numbers, Open the Eyes of My Heart, followed by Trust and Obey.
All right, good morning. Our first scripture reading today is Luke 24, verses 13 through 27. Now on that same day, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Jesus asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us, that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe that all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. And now I invite our young folks, or our young at heart folks, to come forward for a message. How many of you guys like to go walking? Yeah? Where do you like to walk? You like to walk with your mom where? Down the street. Okay, that's cool. How about you, yeah? With the grandma and the dog. Which do you prefer, the dog or grandma? Okay. Yeah? Yeah, you got a big dog, don't you? Yeah. You like walking. Do you like walking with people? Sometimes people go walking in the woods. Do you ever go walking in the woods? Yeah? Do you like that? That's kind of fun. Do you ever have to go walk someplace like for school? Do you ever have to walk to school? Do you like walking to school? Yeah, me neither. Yeah. Running through the woods, that's kind of fun. Yeah. Well, the, the scripture that we heard today talked about Jesus walking with some people who were leaving the city of Jerusalem after the resurrection of Jesus. But they didn't know that Jesus had raised from the dead. They thought he was still dead. So they're walking along, and then Jesus walked by them, and they don't recognize it's him. Now, I always thought that was kind of funny because they would have known who he was. But maybe when you don't expect to see him, you don't really recognize him. But they were walking along, and he was explaining to them about all the things that had happened, and they didn't understand. And so he explained to them about all the things about himself that they should have realized. Sometimes when we walk, it's just a walk, right? Sometimes we walk, you have to walk to the car. You have to walk through here. There's a lot of places to walk around here. I really get my steps in when I walk around here. But sometimes you're walking with friends, right? And that's a different kind of walk. 
Sometimes you walk in nature and you look around and you see all the beauty of nature. So you walk with them, do you? Yeah. Sometimes we walk and we're sad. Sometimes we walk and we're happy. Sometimes we walk and we think we're alone. Do you ever feel like that? Well, these disciples thought that they were alone and then Jesus came to them. But one of the things I want you to think about is that we're never really alone when we have Jesus with us. Now, we might not be able to see Jesus or touch Jesus or hear Jesus or go over and listen to him in our ears, but we can listen to him in our hearts. Wherever we walk, wherever we go, whatever we do, Jesus is there. Isn't that kind of cool? When you feel alone, when you're with friends, when you're walking and jumping and hopping and skipping, whatever you're doing, Jesus is there. And I think that's kind of cool because sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I forget. You forget? And I feel sad. And then I remember that Jesus is there. Sometimes I get angry. You ever get angry? And you think, ugh. That sometimes you don't have words even for it. You just, Ugh. But then I remember that Jesus is there. Sometimes I wonder if anybody loves me. Do you ever feel like that? But then I remember that Jesus is there. And you know what? Jesus is there not only in our hearts, but when we have and share time with other people. And it's up to you and I to be Jesus to other people who are sad and struggling. Yeah. It's a walking stick. Sometimes, if you're walking in mud, you need a stick. It's to help, or if you need to pick up trash. Or not, you don't want to step on your foot. Am I going to let one? You can touch it, yeah. Don't touch the end of it, though, because it's kind of pointy. Huh? You don't have to touch. You can touch it if you want to. Just be careful. Okay. Yeah. So just remember, wherever you go, whatever you do, Jesus is with you. And wherever you go, whatever you do, you can be Jesus for each other. So let's pray. We thank you, God, that you are with us in the person of Jesus. We thank you for his love that guides and directs us. We thank you that when we're sad or mad or hurt or alone, or when we're in the company of such wonderful friends like today, that you are present with us and we can know your love. Amen. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Uh, today is a beautiful spring day, um, kind of the season of stewardship, I think. You know, everybody talks about spring cleaning. It's finally gotten warm. It's not so such a task to go outside and take out all the old clothes and boxes and things that have piled up in the basement. I think stewardship uh, has a lot of meanings, but um, one of them is, you know, the maintenance. And I think maintenance to me is, you know, 10% fixing, but it's 90% cleaning, really. You're just cleaning something so it'll work right again. And uh, I think a lot of things um, build up in our minds and our hearts that kind of stop our, uh, our way of, uh, of functioning. You know, and uh, I think sometimes we need that. I think God helps clear our minds and brings us back to base level and helps us feel like a human being again. So I think that's a part of stewardship, too. And uh, I hope you all take time for yourselves to sit with God and kind of clear out some of the old things that might be uh, piling up. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, may you be the stewards of our souls 
and clear the clutter that piles in our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. And let's, next we will have the second scripture reading. Part two, the story continues. <laughs> the second scripture reading is from Luke 24, again, this time from verses 28 through 35. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he were going on. But the disciples urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. God's word for God's people. Let us pray. Lord, may the words which I speak in the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, Joyce and I missed you last week. I hope you had a good time. We missed seeing you guys. It was good for Andrew to see some of his American cousins. We had a good time having a Sunday off, although we... Uh, we did a little bit of singing at my, uh, at my friend Mark's church. Um, I really miss preaching when I don't do it. But the time away was a fun, part spiritual renewal, part catching up with old friends. Andrew went home Thursday, and it was a really blessed time having him here. He thought you all were cool. So that's a pretty good recommendation, I think. He was able to help Joyce and I get a clear perspective on what was happening in our lives here in Lansing. On that evening in the resurrection, some of the disciples of Jesus were walking home after a very difficult events of Good Friday, not aware that Jesus had raised from the dead. Like all the followers of the Nazarene, their hearts were broken but what they needed was a new perspective. One of the things that this passage says to me and I want to share with you is we don't know everything. Now that may be news to you or it may not be news to you, but we think we know how the world works, but we don't really know how the life in Christ can work for us. We know how the world goes. We know how things go. We go from life to death. Everybody is born. Everything is born. Spring is a time when we talk about new birth, whether it's cleaning out your garage or cleaning out our storage locker that we did this week or starting a new project or watching the flowers that you planted last year begin to grow. Everything is born and everything has a lifespan. Even trees that grow majestically have a lifespan. Whether it's one hour or a hundred years, everyone, everything has a lifespan. And the one thing we know that along with taxes, I hope you paid this week, what we know along with taxes is that dead means dead, right? I always think of the line from the Wizard of Oz, she was not only merely dead, she was really most sincerely 
dead. Everything dies from insects to people to trees to planets to stars die. And yet, when a loved one passes, we are surprised. We got news of a member of our former congregation, an older woman who's 95 years old, vibrant up until about the end, who passed away. And we were surprised. She was 95. And yet we were surprised. And we have to find a way when tragedy strikes us to move forward, to get back on track again. When a loved one dies, a part of us does too. A part of us feels that loss a part of us does not continue. But we have to move forward. There was a lady in our first church, in our student church in Kentucky who her husband had died, and she talked about her husband dying, and we thought it was last week, and it had been 10 years. She had not been able to move on at all. But we have to be able to move forward. And that doesn't mean we didn't love the person. That just means that we need to move forward with our lives. We know everything we think, but we don't know a lot of things. We, don't, we know that some things never change. What our passage, the passage of the Passion reminds us is that people will always hate people. No matter what, hate is almost as strong an emotion as love. And sometimes it's easier to hate than it is to love. If people hated Jesus, what chance do I have? If people hated Jesus, what chance do any of us have? As the old song goes, Jesus was just all right with me. What chance do we have? People learn hatred. They're not born with hatred. They learn hatred, so that is our fault. We teach mistrust. We hear about mistrust. We learn how to hate. My son reminded me that I was watching the news four times a day. That's an awful lot of hate to watch, isn't it? So he said, Dad, cut it down to two. I'm even trying to count it down to one or maybe one every other day. Because that's an awful lot of hate to deal with, isn't it? There's an awful lot of anger, an awful lot of hatred, an awful lot of fear. And people will always resist change when it happens. But change is one of those things that always happens. From the very hungry caterpillar all the way up to you and I. Change is inevitable. Change happens. Change is what it is. But change can also be a catalyst to hate. Those people move into our neighborhood. Those people who speak funny and have a foreign accent. Those people who dress funny or love other people than we love, or go to different schools. So, you know, it's amazing to me how the rivalry between schools can lead to hatred. How saying we're number one says you're number two. And that can build up a kind of hatred. Or getting into the wrong car, or knocking on the wrong door can get you killed. What level of mistrust and hatred has there to be in our lives? But change always comes. It always does. And yet we're surprised because life is change. If it wasn't, we would all be crawling on the ground. Do you remember when your children first learned to walk and talk? You couldn't wait for them to walk and talk, and when they started, you couldn't wait for them to shut up and sit down. 
But change always happens. It always happens. Life is change. People will always resist that change and people will always die for their faith. There are always martyrs. There are always people who will put themselves in between so others can be protected. Happened to be watching the first Avengers movie last night. And Captain America says to Tony Stark, you always look out for number one. But it was Tony Stark who took the nuclear bomb, I'm sorry, it's a spoiler if you haven't seen it, took the nuclear weapon up and, and saved the world. Because someone will always stand in the breach and protect. Someone will always be there to protect. Some will always be willing to be martyred and people are always willing to martyr others. People are always willing to take someone else's life. People are always willing to make a martyr of someone. But we can make a change in the world. We know that people know the stories of Jesus. They know some of them like Christmas and Easter Although Christmas gets wrapped up with Christmas trees and Easter gets wrapped up with bunnies, sometimes you wonder if it was a bunny who came out of the empty tomb. We get the stories mixed up. We don't really necessarily know all the stories. We don't know, a lot of people don't know stories like the one we heard today on the road to Emmaus. Or they hear the story about this phrase, the road to Emmaus, but they don't really know what the story is all about. We know the stories. We know about Noah's Ark. We've heard about that. We know about the Good Samaritan. We've heard that. But we don't necessarily know the significance of the stories. And people kind of have the wrong picture of Jesus, too. They think of Jesus the baby. And it's easy to think about Jesus the baby because babies don't call into question your belief system. But Jesus the man did. We think of Jesus the shepherd. You've seen those pictures, haven't you? Jesus the shepherd carrying the sheep on his shoulder. What a lovely little picture. Jesus never really was a shepherd. But we think that he was. Because of that little story. We think that he was. We get wrapped up in the story. But the sheep don't follow the shepherd. We need to tell people who Jesus really is. Jesus, the revolutionary. Jesus, the one who stood up for the oppressed. Jesus, the one who ate with sinners. Jesus, the one who who called people who were righteous to a higher standard. People who, Jesus who said to people, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Jesus the Savior who died that we might have new life. So what do we know? We know that Jesus is risen. We believe the stories because we believe the people who told the stories. Jewish law says that it requires two witnesses. There were two on the road. He appeared to Simon, but then he appeared to the rest of them, Luke tells us. In John's gospel, John and Peter run toward the tomb. One goes in and the other one looks in, but doesn't go in first. So when they get there, they see the same picture. Two witnesses. And we believe the stories because we believe the ones who tell us the stories, don't we? We believe what grandma and grandpa tell us. We hear stories about the war. We had a young or a man who just died who was on the Arizona just recently in World War II. Now, any of you remember World War II? It was in all the papers. How do we know World War II happened? 
We saw the videos. Well, videos can be doctored. We saw the documentaries. We read the papers. Well, those can be doctored. Well, Grandma and Grandpa told us. Oh, we believe the ones who tell us the story. We know that the story of Jesus has risen is from our own experience. We experience love and we believe that it's true. We experience grace and we know forgiveness. And because of that, we're able to forgive others. And when we forget, others remind us. Going to church for me is like eating. Sometimes you have to eat just in order to make it through the day. Sometimes you have to eat just to have enough strength to go on. Sometimes you have to come to church to be reminded of grace and faith, especially if you watch the news four times a day. You have to go to be reminded that grace happens, that God loves you, and that God wants us to love one another. We know that we're different. We know that society tries to divide us up into subcategories. We know all the subcategories, don't we? Millennials, Gen Xs, male, female, trans. We know all the categories they try to put us into rather than just being people. But Galatians 3, 28 tells us that we are one in Christ Jesus. We seek to be served rather than to serve others. Jesus gives us example when he washes the disciples' feet and gives us how to live out that example when in John 21, 17, he tells Peter, and by way of the scripture, us to feed his sheep. We love because Jesus first commanded us the old commandment that Jesus talks about and reminds us is to love God and love neighbor. But in John 13, 34, he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And how did he love them? He forgave them. He died for them. And he rose again for us. We are the change that the world needs. We're not a club, although people think of it as a club. There's a, there's a church called Country Club Christian Church. That's because the town is called Country Club. I think maybe they could have come up with a better name, probably. But don't we think of that sometimes? You have to do things to get into membership. You have to believe certain things. You have to sign certain things on the dotted line. You have to say certain things about something like it's a club. And we can think of giving our offerings as paying dues, but that's not what it is. A lot of churches, a lot of church people, when they don't agree with what the church is doing, holds back their tithes. Well, let me tell you, you're not, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark, but you're not, and the other elders, you're not giving to the church. You're giving to God and trusting the church to use it the best way that God can. That's why we give. That's how we give. That's how we share and what we do together. It's not an organization, but an organism. Organizations are human designed and destined to fail. Remember when the Boy Scouts started? You might have heard stories about that. You might remember growing up and Boy Scouts being huge and now they're smaller. You might remember churches being huge, and now they're smaller. Even the Rotary and the Kiwanis and all those organizations are getting smaller and smaller. Because human organizations will fail. But the church is a living thing. Because Christ is living in it. We are not a religion. We are a fellowship of believers. A religion is a system of beliefs and practices and you have to sign on the dotted line that you believe those things. But a, Christianity is a fellowship of the faithful. 
It's a fellowship of frail followers. Human beings doing the best they can for the Savior they love. In the introduction to this book that the elders are reading and I'm going to be talking about in the next couple of weeks, it's called I Am a Church Member by Tom Rainer. And I want to read to you this passage on page four of the introduction. It says this. Based on our research of 557 churches from 2004 to 2010, nine out of 10 churches in America are declining or growing at a pace that is slower than that of the communities. Simply stated, churches are losing ground in their own backyards. Another way of looking at it is generally. About two-thirds of the builder generation, those born before 1946, are Christians. But only 15% of the millennials are Christians. The millennials are the largest generation in American history and almost about 80 million members. They were born between 1980 and 2000. And we have all but lost that generation. We can blame it on the secular culture, and we often do. We can blame it on the godless politics of our nation, and we do that as well. We can even blame it on the churches, the hypocritical members and the uncaring pastors. Lots of Christians are doing that. But I am proposing that we, our church members, need to look in the mirror. That congregations across America are weak because many of us have lost the biblical understanding of what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. We join churches expecting others to serve us, to feed us, and to care for us. But we need to join churches so that we can love and care for one another. As your interim minister, it is my task to help you prepare for the next stage in the life of this church. And I'm not concerned about whether this church becomes a mega church or not. I am working us toward being a stronger community of faith. But what kind of community of faith are we going to be? We are disciples of Christ's congregation. That means we have an open table and open heart for people who have different opinions. Our mission is to share the love of Jesus Christ with everyone but particularly with those who are oppressed, outcast, and poor. As the Trust and Obey song says, we walk on our way, we walk with Jesus day by day, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk along the way and learn along the way where Jesus wants us to go. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for trusting us to walk beside you, for opening our hearts and minds to the leading of your spirit and to know your grace today and always. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our invitational hymn uh, number 216. Christ the Lord is risen today.
We come now to a time of prayer. I've known many people, and I'm sure you've heard this phrase before, someone say, I don't listen to the news because it's too depressing. And I was reflecting on that this week as I was listening to the news, and it was, in fact, quite depressing. And I was reminded that that depression leads to growth. That re depression, that, that, that feeling of hopelessness leads to action, leads to inspiration, that pain leads to healing, that just like the phoenix rises from the ashes, Jesus rose from the tomb. We have to watch the news. We have to hear that. Because if we don't know, we won't be called to pray, to act, to speak out. So now let us take a moment to praise, but also to pray for pain. Holy Creator, you gave us a world of contradiction so that we might see where differences appear and might learn to accept and welcome all of the many variations that you have surrounded us with in this world. You gave us tulips, both red and yellow, so that we would know the colors as their own unique gifts. You gave us species among species of birds so that we might appreciate the robin for being ours here in Michigan. You gave us life, but you gave us death so that we might more fully appreciate our moments here on earth. You give us silence so that we might not only appreciate the joyful noise, but so that we might also hear you. Together with Elaine, we pray for light and healing on Gina, a teenager who is struggling with deep depression. We pray for all of those who struggle to feel your light. With Donald and Yvonne, we pray for Corey and Ebenia that they may love on each other just as Jesus loves us. And also with Donald and Yvonne, we pray for their son Derek for his protection and direction. We pray for all those who are struggling to find their path. With the McAvoys, we pray for Jim's boss, whose 37-year-old son died in a car accident on Friday. And we pray for Sadie's harp teacher, whose husband died Saturday morning, ending a long struggle with Parkinson's disease. We pray for all those who are struggling with illness. We celebrate with those who overcome it. And we mourn with those who are finding healing in the release of pain and in death. We pray with Patricia for the Belfon family for Mr. Everard Belfon's memorial service this coming Monday. And again, we pray with Yvonne and Donald. Let us pray and serve others who do not know Jesus, for through his death, he opens paradise to all who believe and, and serve. We open our hearts and our minds in this moment to pray to you the silent prayers that we're not yet ready to speak aloud, but that weigh heavily on us. And together, we pray the words that you taught us, our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth here as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen you may stay seated but we invite you to join us in singing hymn number 231 sing of one who walks beside us mm -hmm. 
Did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke? Wait a minute, Jesus. Don't go any further. Stay here and eat with us. And he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, some scholars have said it was the way that he did it, in the fact that he blessed it and broke it instead of broke it and blessed it, but I think that's being a bit pedantic. I think it was the fact that it's at the communion table that we see Jesus. It's at this table who he invited us to, who breaks the bread using our hands, who pours out the cup using our hands, who shares it using our hands, and who helps us receive it using our hands. So, we invite you on his behalf to come and share in the feast where he is present in the bread and in the cup and in the hearts of everyone who comes to share. On the night in that upper room, Jesus took the bread and blessed it, and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And likewise, after supper, he took a cup and again he gave thanks and he said, take all of you and drink from this for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. Dear God, Dear God. As we come to your sacred table, we remember how you died for the sins of all of us. 
yet we are welcomed by your mercy to share the feast that the eternal God of salvation has set. May we be filled not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In your name we pray, amen. And so we now go out to share the good news of God's love. We go out to share the blessing that Christ has given to us. And we go out to be the blessing in the world today. And the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit go with you today and always. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's stand and sing, Go, my children, with my blessing.